All right, what's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Living the Dream podcast. Today on the show, we have Pranay Parikh, who is the co-founder of Ascent Equity Group and host of the MD to Entrepreneur podcast. Pranay, how you doing? I'm doing well. Top. Thanks. Yeah, of course, of course. Excited to have you here. We like to jump right in. So if you could start with telling us a little bit more about yourself and what you like to do for fun, that'd be great. Yeah, so uh, I, I'm a, a medical doctor here in the U.S., uh, and uh, so I spent most of my life doing that um, and still practice. People are surprised that I have so much going on, but, you know, I, I love medicine and still uh, enjoy doing it. Uh, what I do for fun, uh, I really like fitness. You know, um, before we started having children, uh, I have a young 18-month-old. We, used to, My wife and I used to go hiking. We used to go to spin class and stuff we'll probably pick it back up uh shortly but you know we love the outdoors we love uh going out and just you know seeing the world we travel a lot uh, eat out a lot that's kind of one of our favorite things to do there we go there we go what's your favorite uh type of food when you eat out you know we're pretty flexible usually the fine dining is french uh so uh what i like a lot is seeing the french uh the french kind of uh uh, fusion foods so you'll have like uh a sushi chef that was classically trained in france you know mm. or uh there's a restaurant here where it's a uh, indian dude went to france to learn how to cook and now he cooks indian food with like a hint of uh french uh exposure so it's pretty cool wow yeah that is really cool i didn't know that cooking was such a serious thing that you would like travel to get trained yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, if you look at the Michelin stars, um, which is so Michelin tires that everyone knows, they created this like amazing marketing campaign because they wanted people to drive. Right. So they uh, they said, how do we get people to drive? Oh, people like to eat. So let's make this list of amazing restaurants. And, you know, it's been going on for 50 plus years. And there's three different levels. There's Michelin one star, Michelin two star, Michelin three star. Michelin one star is like, hey, this is a really good place one of the best in the area you should go if you're in the area two is like if you're kind of close you should make a trip there three is like this place is so good you should make a trip to this area just to eat that food you know uh so uh if you look at the rankings a lot of the people uh who are the three michelin stars and two are trained classically in french french france has a lot of the the kind of finer things in life like uh, fashion design right chanel hermes all that stuff and food yeah i gotcha and so my question is you s kind of coined it as a really good marketing play yeah does the quality line up with the three Michelin, two Michelin, and one Michelin stars? Like, is it that tiers or are some one Michelin as good as three Michelin and they're just kind of on their way? It is very subjective as food is, you know? I mean, I live in Los Angeles. We have some hole in the walls that are amazing, right? Yeah. You, you 20 bucks, you get a, you feed a family of four and you're just very happy, you know? Mm -hmm. The, the threes, they have to have something special. So it's, it's really, so like, uh, if anyone's been to Chicago, Chicago Alenia, uh, which is a restaurant by this dude, um, who after making the restaurant lost his tongue to cancer and so had to teach himself to taste again. So there's like this story behind this restaurant and it's, it's not just the food, it's an experience. So by the time you walk in, it's, it's, it's like, it's almost like a play, you know, everything is choreographed. This level of service is insane. And also the price is insane. So, yeah. so, so you're paying for a lot of it. So it depends, you know, so usually the three Michelin stars, um, if you're good, if you're going for one good, if you're just going for good food, one Michelin is plenty, you know, um, and it's probably expensive too. Uh, but two and three, it's more of an experience. It's to taste and it's something that's memorable. I gotcha. I gotcha. And so for work, are you still an MD or have you transferred fully into entrepreneurship? Still an MD. Yeah. Still, still a little bit both, you know, uh, fortunately the, my medical practice is, uh, full of entrepreneurs. So do a lot of entrepreneurship, you know, um, so like, for example, my position in the medical group uh, was one they had never created before. Uh, you know, I'm director of education. Uh, and usually, you know, most hospital groups don't have that. Uh, but 
was able to create that because of they saw all the cool stuff I was doing in the education front uh, outside of medicine. And they're like, hey, could you do some of that stuff for us? We'll pay you more and, uh, you know, everyone will benefit. So I think even if you're in uh, in a W-2, for example, you know, there's a lot of stuff you could do inside of your organization that people will see and help you kind of move up the organization. I gotcha. I gotcha. Yeah, that um, the thing you got to realize when you're a W-2 employee is you are working in a business that was started by an entrepreneur who probably appreciates entrepreneurial tendencies as long as you don't try to overthrow them and like force them out of their business. <laughs> um, yeah. So I like that. I think that's really cool. Nice. Well, tell us about Ascent Equity Group. What's uh, what's that? Yeah. So, quick story on that. So, uh, you know, after I graduated residency, I was looking for a place to put my money. So, uh, I didn't want to put it in my retirement accounts and not have access to it for thirty years. You know, I've already had twenty years of delayed gratification, so I didn't want to wait another thirty. So, looked around, found real estate, bought my first property, and I thought. I'd buy one a year for the next five to 10 years and then retire, you know? And uh, after my first one, I just spent like 100 to 200 hours looking for my next one. I realized now that my first one was a home run. You know, I it wasn't typical. I just got super lucky. Yeah. And so I looked for a way to invest in real estate without spending all that time, you know? Um, and it was really becoming a second job, looking for these properties, going to look at it, putting offers, you know, uh, fighting. I'm also in Los Angeles, so it's a little bit more competitive, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, then I found passive real estate, also called syndications, where um, like you invest in the stock market, say I bought a bunch of shares in Apple, you could buy a bunch of shares in an apartment complex, like one apartment complex, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and you get a group of people and then you have like professional people, real estate people that are running it. I was like, that's awesome. Uh, and all the tax benefits, everything goes to you according to how much you own, you know, all the profits and all that stuff. It's like, that sounds great. You know, let me do a bunch of that. But how do I do that? You know, they don't teach you that in med school. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, you know, there weren't any books at the time. So I talked to my business partner at the time. And I was like, hey, we should create a course on how to teach people how to invest, you know, teach doctors because they don't have all this time to go find all these deals, you know, but they want to be able to invest. So we created the course, thousands of people took it and we thought we were done. You know, you teach a woman how to fish and she can go out fishing, you know, yep. you don't need to keep doing that. But after taking our course, most people realize that they don't have the time to even do the vetting, you know, which takes, you know, five to 10 hours, um, per per deal you know maybe maybe on the lower end about five hours uh but they don't want to do that so they're like hey Pradeh, you're already investing deals you're doing all this vetting you're doing all these negotiations like why don't we just all come together invest in those deals and we could get better deals better terms and negotiate better so that's how ascent started you know we just did a small piece of a very large deal but over time we got bigger and uh, we were able to take down whole deals by ourselves and kind of throw our weight around a little bit. Yeah, I gotcha. And so now are you guys at the point where you've hired out acquisitions and you have the investor relations and so you guys are a full machine, you don't really partner as much or are you still partnering with operators to find and run the properties? Great question. I, I think there's three parts in a real estate syndication company. Acquisitions, as you mentioned, so you go out, you find a property, you negotiate, you buy it, you know, that's a, that's a beast. And uh, that uh, is a lot of smoothing, you know, you get a lot of taking people out to dinner and, it, you know, it's not like residential where it's so easy to find properties. This, you, you know, there's a big group of people. It's very, there's a small group of people and you got to wine and dine them, you know. Um, two is asset management. Like after you buy the property, is it, uh, working as it should, all the renovations, are you increasing rents, all that stuff. And then three is raising money um, because you need to raise money for the deal, right? So uh, there are those three distinct um, roles. And I find most people will do either one or two of those. It's very rare that people will do all three. So what we have decided to focus on is raising the money. You know, we have a large list of doctors uh, and ourselves who want to invest in deals. And Usually the people that raise money, that's all they do. But we also asset management. So that means after we partner with someone who does acquisitions, buys the property, 
we're we're looking at the property every week, you know, going to it up to twice a month, at least, at least in the beginning, to make sure that our partner is doing what they say they're doing. And because we've done this so often that we can help them, you know, increase occupancy, you know, decrease debt and all that stuff. So we do uh, capital raising and asset management. I love it. I love it. And so capital raising, asset management, do you guys also, so kind of how I'm kind of familiar with syndications Uh and oftentimes you need somebody to sign on the loan as a key principal. Can you guys sign on the loan and carry the debt too, because you're big enough now? And I noticed you said you could throw your weight around, or do you guys also bring in a key principal? So when we partner with someone, we partner with someone that doesn't need that. So, uh, we partner with people that have billions. Um, so because, um, you know, we are, we've, we are able to write pretty big checks and take down pretty big properties. We're able to partner with people who we think are the best or best, you know, we have all the, uh, systems in place to kind of do it ourselves. Uh, but we think, you know, uh, our role, our best role is managing. So, you know, for example, if you owned a Seven Eleven, right. Yep. And you own it hundred percent yourself and but you're working there nine to five every day, Monday through Sunday, right? Um, it's po- it's probably going to do well because you're you're going to uh, do operations, but you don't really have the time to think like, how am I going to get more customers? What should I increase prices on, right? Because you're so busy working, but because our partner is focusing on maintenance, leasing, all that, all that stuff that has to be done, but doesn't move the needle, we're able to sit back and say, okay, yeah, here's where we should increase rents. You know, maybe we should add pet rent. Maybe we should uh, add washer dryer, you know, like those small little things that move the needle a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I gotcha. That's really cool, man. I love it. And so when you're saying you're partnering, are you partnering with primarily operators? Are you partnering with institutional grade operators? Like, is it more the small scale operators who just have the experience and have been doing it for 10, 20 years or more like, the Blackstones, who are like just institutional, uh, maybe not as big as Blackstone, but I think you get my point. So we actually play the role of Blackstone. So Blackstone, Goldman Sachs, what they do, so they, when they go into a market, they don't, you know, they don't send their people in their $4,000 suits to go talk to maintenance, you know? So what they do is they partner with operators that are boots on the ground, you know, that are local, oh, that see. work, you know? So a lot of our partners literally work with Goldman Sachs. So like we did a deal, uh, it was about $50 million deal. And we're like, oh, that's a lot of money, you know? Uh, <laughs> we're like, you know, we were like, okay, happy. You know, we, we filled it in a couple of weeks. And the very next deal, they asked us if we wanted to be a uh, part of the GP, you know, the the people that run it. Uh, and it was a four hundred and thirty million dollar deal uh, with the same operator. So we're like, yeah, you know. And this, uh, so the <laughs> GP puts in. Uh, so usually when they do uh, with like the large institutional, they'll do ninety ten. So I was like, oh yeah, how much is ten percent? Uh, because then we would get half of that, right? How, yeah, I was like, oh, 10%. That doesn't sound like a, mon- a lot of money. $43 million. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so if we wanted to do what is called a co-GP, uh, co-general partners with this operator, we'd have to put in $21 million. So that's a lot of money. But what well, Goldman Sachs and Blackstone, they buy multiple properties at the same time. We usually buy one. I gotcha. I gotcha. Oh, man, that is so cool. <laughs> I love it. I... Real estate syndication is like my end all be all for wealth building. Like it's the business that I want to build and that's going to be like my baby, which is why I just love talking about it. So maybe we spent a bit too much time on it, but (laughs) (laughs) I appreciate you sharing your insight with me. That was helpful. Well, you know, you're, you're doing the right thing by building an audience and a thought leadership platform uh, before you start anything. Like that's where I tell a lot of people to start, you know? Mm-hmm. And I have a podcast too, but I started it after like all this stuff. Uh, but it, because my business partner, Peter Kim, he had a thought leadership platform way before we started any of this. Uh, it's just been so much easier to do everything else, right? So uh, before you build anything, build an audience, you know, and the, you can kind of take them wherever you go, right? It's like Kim Kardashian, no matter what she creates, she has an existing fan base, right? Yeah. And it's going to be successful. Yeah. Are you a fan of Alex Hormozzi? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I he, he is freaking great. Every day I'm like, 
man, how does this dude have such great insight? Yeah. <laughs> and he's super buff. I want to look those good in uh that good in uh short shorts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, the man's ripped it. He he kind of talked about that audience thing and it kind of blew my mind. Like, I don't know why I didn't realize it before, but I've had a, a couple of entrepreneurs really talking about it that I follow. Alex, Ryan Pineda is out who's out in Las Vegas and does some real estate. He was like, attention is like the new currency. And like if you can gather and multiply attention on social media, every business you make will be a billion dollar business, which is why Mr. Beast like didn't sell his business for a billion dollars because it has 10 billion to 20 billion potential in the next 10 years, which is, um yeah, just cool stuff, man. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. But attention is the new currency for sure. Yeah. And as you are growing, you know, I know uh, for me, I have a pretty new podcast and, you know, and it's starting, I'd get like five downloads, you know, it's not a ton more, a little bit more, not a ton more, but it's like, especially if it's longer form, you know, 30, 40 minutes, it's like people are giving you your time, even if it's five people, right? That's five people that are giving you 40 minutes of your time. And yep. so that's, that means a lot. You don't necessarily need to have thousands. It's nice, you know, but you just need a couple hundred of people that are willing to give you your their, their time, right? Because we all, you know, we have different amounts of money, uh, to be able to afford things, right? But we all have the same amount of time. So if you're getting, uh, especially if it's the right audience, like for me, it's doctors, like getting 40 minutes from a doctor, like that's that's a big deal. And so, uh, you know, eventually with whatever I do, I could just kind of take them on. And uh, as long as I'm providing valuable content to them, um, that's the key. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. Well, let's go ahead and jump into your motivation. It yeah. seems like you've already gotten a lot of success up to this point in your life. So what really gets you up and keeps you going? It's it's family for sure. You know, and uh, it, it's a little ironic because a lot of times uh, families what uh, gets uh, uh, get sacrificed, you know, and that's something that I'm dealing with every day, right? It's because it's, you sacrifice a little bit of family time, you know, every time yep. you do this, right? Like, uh, like I dropped off my son to daycare this morning. Right. And it was like, uh, the, the look of betrayal every time you just uh, hand him off, you know? Oh yeah. <laughs> every time. Like, how could you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hard sacrifice uh, to make, but, um, no. yeah, yeah. But it, it's, it's, you know, my, um, my uh my wife and I both our parents like they sacrificed a lot my dad came from a town that didn't have toilets till like 10 years ago you know uh that uh they were using a hole in the wall in the floor you know uh and I didn't have to live through that because my dad got a master's came to the U.S. and all that stuff so but he sacrificed a ton while I was growing up you know working every day working multiple jobs um and so I wanted to be a different type of dad, you know, because I had the ability to do that, you know, spend more time with my wife um, and son and my other son that's coming up soon. Uh, and so that's, that's the motivation, not, you know, not 10 years in the future, 20 years in the future, but like along the way, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I've been trying to do this very intentionally. We take a lot of vacations, you know, um, despite it being horrible to travel with an infant and a toddler, uh, yeah. infant travel as much as you can with an infant. Cause it's way worse with a toddler that I'm not really? realizing way worse. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they're mobile and yeah. they can't sit still, you know, and they want to run around, uh, at least the infant, you could like put him to sleep, you know? Yeah. Uh, and they sleep a lot. Uh, but toddlers, man, person, they need to, constant attention you know <laughs> and but but we we make those sacrifices because uh then we can travel with them and you know a lot of people say hey uh they're not going to remember anything and they're right but i'm going to remember it my wife yeah. is going to remember it you know and those memories are going to be there so i uh, we are doing uh you know uh tim ferris talks about a gradual retirement where you know instead of being like okay yeah at 60 i'm going to just do everything i want you know, now I try to inject in uh stuff that I want to do in the future. Like uh, I bought a, I bought a PlayStation. It was like sitting in the corner for literally months. Like yeah. just, and I was like, I, I I finally opened it up. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna not be productive for the next two hours and just 
waste away and play some video games but i think you have to put in some of those times where you're not productive you know because we're especially as high achievers we're like every single second has to be like a podcast we have to be listening to something reading something and we almost get this like guilt when we're not being productive uh, but I, I think trying to trying to inject some of that like family and also sometimes that you're like you're alone maybe playing video games or maybe playing some basketball or going for a hike or something where you're just like not being productive i, I think it, it'll just help amplify things in the future yeah yeah no absolutely i think what's so interesting about that is i think there are productive things that aren't necessarily effective and I've heard a lot of entrepreneurs talk about the fact that effectiveness is really key. Like you don't want to just be busy, busy, busy all the time. You want to be really effective in the time that you are busy so that you can do the things that you want to do outside of whatever productive work that you're doing. And I just think that's so interesting because sometimes we trick ourselves, like I'll listen to an audiobook for like two hours and I'll count that as productive time. But really it was just about as effective as going and playing Fortnite. Because <laughs> yeah. I probably didn't apply that audiobook to my yeah. life and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah and, and for people that have employees, they, you know, they model themselves just like children. They model themselves after you, right? Mm -hmm. And so um for uh if you, one of your core values isn't work life balance, you need to change that. So <laughs> because right now we're having such an issue finding great employees and secondary retaining them. So in our mission is saying like we value work-life balance and you know so for most people that's like saying that enron values integrity right that was one of their core pillars you know but it's how do you how do you uh how do you show that in your own life right so you got to have some work-life balance right so for example it's small things right so i i don't um uh, we use slack as our communication platform so uh i I am working on a business all the time, or at least I'm thinking about the business all the time, right? As a founder. But I used to send messages at 2 a.m. I'm like, hey, here's this great idea, you know? Yeah. Uh, and on weekends, just to get it out of my brain. Um, but Slack has this feature where you can be like, okay, send it at 9 a.m. on Monday, you know? Yeah. Or 9 a.m. the next day. So I'm like, hey, guys, like, this is... Off hours is off hours. Like spend it with your family. Like I don't want you checking email during vacation. Um, and I actually had to force some people to take vacation. I'm like, you have paid time off now. Go. Yeah. You know, like I want to hear, I want to hear like what you did with your family, you know? Um, and I think doing that, people see what you value, you know? And uh, then you're going to keep them from being burned out. You're going to have them fresh, you know? Uh, and you don't want people just sitting there, right? Like, especially now in the holidays, like I'm like, take time off, uh, you know, uh, enjoy yourself. Don't check your email. Um, and then come back and we, you know, we, we do it. Um, I don't know the technical term, but it's, it's called like the lion mode where you work like a lion, where you're, you do these sprints and you just sit and be lazy. I don't know if you've looked at, if you've seen them, like, uh, whenever I see a picture of a lion, it's always just like, like just <laughs> relaxing you know just like yeah. being a bum uh but then like when it's time to hunt they're oh, gone goodness. you know they're gone and like they're all muscle like the it, it you know there's there's like no fat on them so you know they're not being lazy but they're just preserving uh strength right yeah and resting up and so when it's time and in real estate we do a lot of sprints so we have deals you know when it's a deal time it is crazy it's like a, 60, 70 hour weeks, you know? So then I want people to be well rested and have that work life balance for the rest of them. I gotcha. I gotcha. I like that you mentioned the lion because lions sleep for like 20 hours a day. <laughs> but that four hours that they're up and they're active, it's such an effective four hours that they can afford to sleep those 20 hours. So um, I like the parallel to real estate too. Deal weeks, we're sprinting. And then um, in between those, you know, we're resting. We're like making sure we're taking care of ourselves and our families. So that's really cool, man. Well, awesome. Pranay, you got we... to do it with, uh, you got to do it with intention. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think, uh, you can't expect. So I think with, uh, with work-life balance, you have to just do it with the same intention that you do your other values. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I like that a lot. Well, Pranay, we got, um, 
a lot of meat of the podcast. We haven't even gotten into the meat of the podcast yet. Let's <laughs> uh, <laughs> still get through. So I'm going to go ahead and jump to your dreams and goals, man. Tell us about your vision for your life and your company. Yeah. So for my life, uh, I l like the idea of being uh, to go anywhere. You know, I want to travel. I want to uh, live in different places. I was uh, in uh, Mexico with my uh, my wife and my infant. I was like, uh, working, of course, a little bit, you know, uh, checking yeah. emails and stuff. I was like, yeah, I could get used to this, you know, I could get yeah. used to being able to live. Um, so I've always wanted to, you know, live in France for a couple of months and take in the culture every, uh, and live in Italy and, you know, not, not feel rushed. I hate, I hate traveling and feeling like I have to go from thing to thing, you know, cause I only have like four days to see everything. Uh, I want to, yeah. I eat some of the food, travel, you know, see some of the stuff that isn't maybe necessarily known by everyone. Um, so, uh, you know, have that, uh, have a little bit more flexibility with uh, my life, you know. So um, if someone's having a birthday party uh, in my family, like uh, uh, in a different state, it'd be cool to be able to just pick up and leave, you know. So having that flexibility would be great. Um for the the company, um, we want to be the go to resource for doctors, um, anything finance. So, uh, you know, you can say, hey, I have a couple hundred thousand to invest, and I want to be well diversified. What do you have? You know, right now we focus very narrowly on um, multifamily syndications, um, and very specifically value add, where we go in, we buy it, we renovate it, we sell it. You know, very simple. Um, but you know we're looking at office buildings, uh, medical offices. We want to be pretty well diversified uh, in that. Uh, so then you know uh, I tell everyone like if someone had this created when I was looking to invest, I wouldn't have created it. It's a lot more work to create it myself, you know. Uh, but because there isn't something like that, um, we want it to be easy because you know even if you have a couple million dollars, which is a lot of money. It's hard to find someone that would be like, here is where you should go and invest all that stuff, you know, um, which has your um, best interest in mind, especially when it's outside of the stock market. You know, there's financial advisors for stock markets. All that stuff is pretty easy. But I don't know if you've looked at the stock market lately uh, or the bond market. It's down about 25 percent, both of them, you know, and they told you that when stocks go up. Uh, or down the bonds are opposite but right now they're both down so it's nice to have some diversification you know invest in some real estate uh, which has done very well uh, lately um, really over the past 50 years so really over always <laughs> yeah 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 and, and you know it's it, it there are deals that go poorly you know um, and that's why I think it's important to make sure you are trusting the right people but it's it's like LeBron you know if you have you have LeBron on your team and you know they have a great track record, like they're probably going to go to the playoffs, right? So you have to pick the right people and, you know, potentially it could do poorly, but your chance of success is just so much higher. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. And that's why you, like you said, you pick the right people, you find the right deals, you have the experience vetting the deals um, for sure. But even when a deal goes poorly, I find that there's, unless you just didn't know what you were doing at all, there's typically a way to fix the deal. It may not be within the time horizon that you set for the returns. Like a lot of syndications would be three to five years. But if you hold most syndications for like 15 years, 20 years, like if you could do that, if you set up the deal that way, it's going to be hard. You're going to be hard pressed not to end up profitable for the most part. If you That's buy a nice thing. That's the nice thing about real estate because time corrects all wounds, you know? So if you think about it, say you bought in the 1980s with 18% interest rate, right? As long as you survive, now those properties are worth 4X, mm. right? Uh, and you could have refied, you could have done a lot of stuff. But, it, you know, if you would have had to give it back to the bank because you couldn't pay, make your payments, then that's, that's the downside. But yeah. if you could have survived scraped you know um and a lot of people right now are kind of in survival mode because uh interest rates have gone up you know but as long as everyone survives and i don't think right now banks are going to want to take these properties back so i think they're going to be a lot more reasonable with working with people i gotcha gotcha 
Well, awesome. What are the top one to two skills that you need to develop right now to make your dreams and goals come true of location freedom, the time flexibility, as well as being the go-to resource for doctors on anything finance? So in residency, uh, you know, when I was doing training, mostly, most of the stuff you learned were from your colleagues, you know, maybe they had just done a block of cardiology, right. Or pulmonary. Uh, and so there may be 10%, 5% uh, further along than you. Uh, so to ha to start a thought leadership platform, you don't have to feel like you're this expert. You know, over time, you become this expert. I was talking to, uh, I interviewed uh, actually one of the great podcasters. He, he's been podcasting for 16 years. Oh, he's man. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he said, uh, uh, this lady he knows, her, uh, she started a podcast on self-publishing, right? And she didn't know anything about self-publishing. She would just interview people who had self-published. And about a year later, everyone came to her as the expert, you know? But all she had done is interview all these people. So you get associated with uh, people uh, that are sometimes smarter than you, like right now. Uh, and <laughs> are you talking about you being associated with me? I'm talking about yeah, me yeah, being associated yeah. with you. No, <laughs> no, the opposite. The opposite. <laughs> it's it's my honor to be with someone smarter than me. So, <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> see, so, so this, this is what I do. This is why people call me because I I go on all these podcasts and they're like, oh, weren't you on that podcast with that one dude or gal that were really smart? I was like, yep, yeah, they're smart. <laughs> <laughs> This guy, that is so and so, uh, you know, definitely. So just, you know, one, number one, get started, right? Don't feel uh, so, you know, you can see um, behind me and like my microphone and stuff. People are like, oh, wow. Like you only have like 30 episodes. Your setup is pretty nice. I was like, yeah, I didn't do anything else, but look up microphones and like make sure my background was really nice for a year while I was procrastinating on starting my podcast. And after I finally ran out of things to buy and upgrade, I finally started my podcast, but you know, you can start a podcast for like a hundred bucks. You can start a blog for like five bucks, you know, if not free, um, just get out there, you know, cause, um, you know, they, they did this study, uh, in a, a pottery school, um, a pottery course, you know, they said, hey, your final exam is going to be worth 95% of your grade, right? So um, for half the class, they said, hey, um, because this is worth so much, I don't want you thinking about anything other than your final. So no homework, just, just think, do research, do all this stuff, right? Uh, for the other half, they said, hey, uh, I want you to make a pot a day, one pot, one pot every day, you know, and then you have one day to finish your final exam, right? Your very last day. So over 30, it was a 30 day course. So um, if, since I'm telling the story, you'll know which one uh, improved. It's the people that were on iteration 30 when they did their final pot, right? Yeah. But the people that had just spent time thinking, they're like, oh, what kind of handle should I do? You know, uh, on day 29, because we're all procrastinators, they started on their pot anyways, you know, but the people that had done a pot every day, they're like, okay, here's what makes it look nice. Here's what color I should do. Here's what I'm good at, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, get started, start your iterations. Uh, and uh, just remember that, you know, it's not going to be perfect. It's, I know it's scary a lot, uh, putting things out into the real world. Um, I, after my first podcast, my wife is like, uh, man, you're so monotone. Uh, <laughs> put me to sleep. I was like, oh, I'm done podcasting. You know, it's over. <laughs> But, you know, I just, I just kept going, you know, uh, hopefully uh, I got a voice coach, right? So uh, don't just keep trying to, um, to search in uh, while you're blind, right? Um, try to find someone that's going to help you uh, get to the next level, right? So it's, it's not, you know, uh, we hear about this 10,000 hours of practice, right? It's not just 10,000 hours of practicing, because how do you improve? It's 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours of deliberate practice where you have someone that's showing you the ropes, right? Um, and yeah, there's no doubt if you practice by yourself, you're going to get better over time. But having someone that says, hey, here's how you improve. It's just going to, you know, you're going to leapfrog. It's going to go steps higher as opposed to like a nice linear curve. 
Yeah, I really like that you pointed that out. I think Alex talks about, Alex Hormozzi talks about like a time debt that we all pay. And if you can reduce the time debt that you pay with money right now, time is your most valuable asset. So that's like a very good exchange of resources. And so getting a coach, getting a mentor who has misstepped where you're about to misstep and can correct your step will save you a lot of time and sanity. So <laughs> I agree. I agree. Um, the get started, man, it's just, it's hard to get started when you're around people who are like very critical or you feel like you've been criticized your whole life. And so you have that low self-confidence. So what would you say to that person? That, you know, I think we all have imposter syndrome, um, a ton, right. And when someone is, uh, surrounded by critical people, you know, it's a lot of times it's, it's how they grew up. You know, this person I know I had to sit down and I was like, we were going on vacation together and that person was complaining about, you know, playing, being a little late and, you know, just, just random little annoyances. I was like, you need to calm down. Like, yeah. this is, like we're on vacation. Like this is, you're like ruining my mood before we even get there, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then, and then I hung out with that person's parents mm. and I was like, Oh, I get it. I get it. The yep. mom was, every single thing uh she would bring up and complain about you know it's like uh, it's like imprinted into you you know so one it's you know getting yourself away from that right so uh seinfeld jerry seinfeld talks about um when when you're creating something new it's like a baby right you make fun of a baby oh baby you just pooped yourself right no you don't you need it you're like oh this is a key you know, honestly, I see a lot of babies. They're a lot of, they're all like kind of ugly. Uh, Thank until you. Like, <laughs> you know, until like a week or two, a week yep. or two, then they get kind of cute, you know, uh -huh. but like when they're born, they're like, like their face is like yeah. triangle. <laughs> they're like, that's the cutest thing I've seen. I was like, yeah, <laughs> if you like cone heads. <laughs> yeah. I, and so but but you know you treat it like your baby like hey this is like this is the nicest thing you know um uh, and first i'll talk about self criticism and then i'll talk about outside and so he's like this is baby when you're in creator mode you're like the world is perfect right everything you do right um and just create don't edit don't edit you got to separate the editing part i think that's where we have a lot of difficulty and this is more so for writing uh you know you could you write a sentence and you're like no that's not the right word you know no no just keep writing keep writing um some people force themselves not to hit delete uh so you know they just keep writing uh for podcasts you know um when you have a solo episode uh just keep um keep talking and you can listen to it later you can remove stuff but don't don't edit don't you can repeat stuff but don't don't go back and change things you know just keep talking uh and then you change it you don't have this baby anymore you're now you're the, like the harshest like you're like a prison guard right yeah. when you're editing you're hardcore you remove every all the fluff you're 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 like super strict with yourself right so separating the creator super sweet nice like a like a infant you don't do anything wrong right uh with like a prison guard right and, and making sure there's a separation like even uh a chronological separation so separation in time not even the same day you know uh because it, your brain your brain is your brain's kind of dumb you know you, you don't want to mix miss things up too much uh now criticism on the outside uh, is if anyone's criticizing you on the outside, you need to get them out of your life. You know, um, if they're uh, if they're uh, if there's someone like family uh, or uh, like a really close friend, you, you sit down and talk to them. But I can tell you it's, you know, they've probably been like that their whole lives. You know, I'm 37. So they've probably been um, most of my friends are around my age. So they've probably been like that 37, 40 years. You know, it's going to be hard for them to change. But you know, if it's a if it's a relationship you really value, <laughs> you sit down and talk to them. But you can have that relationship without showing them what you created, you know. Um, so you kind of change the relationship. But if it's like an acquaintance, just drop them out of your life. You know, it kind of sucks, but um, it sucks for them that they're 
adding all this negativity to your life because it's life is hard life is hard as a creator you know you you're creating this uh, this art you know podcasting is an art writing's an art all this stuff um and to have someone uh criticize it it's it's painful it's like a stab in the back you know yeah. uh, and you're already like oh man i only got 10 downloads and then joe or jane was uh talking smack about it you know <laughs> uh, i yeah I, I, zero tolerance for that right because yeah. uh and there's this quote that i'm gonna butcher uh from um teddy roosevelt where he's like yeah i don't care about what anyone says like if you're uh a warrior uh in the arena like it's tough i respect anyone that goes out and fights in the arena you know if you're a creator and you're creating something um something of value you know i'm not you know i know there's 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 people out there that are creating trash you know they're racist they're you know all this stuff i'm not including those people um uh but if you're creating something of value good um and you know maybe it sucks but that's fine you know all of us sucked um i there's a there's a quote by uh, Ed Sheeran, you know, a super famous uh, songwriter, and he wrote, um, "Shoot, I'm forgetting the name. I, I think it's it, it's it's his most famous song. It has perfect. Uh, it's just just BS or something or uh, oh, I don't know, I don't know songs that well. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> me neither, me neither. Uh, but uh, this, so it's it has two billion views, two oh. billion, it's the most views ever. But he first wrote it, and he's like. And this thing sucks. And she read, he's like, this yeah. thing sucks. He's like almost threw it away, you know? And he just keep rewriting it, rewriting it, rewriting it, you know, over time. Now it has 2 billion views. There's 8 Thanks. billion of us. Yeah. So that means a quarter of the population has listened to it or probably one person lived listened to it a billion times, you know? <laughs> and that's how he felt about the song when he first wrote it, you know? Uh, so give yourself a break. Um, but imagine if he had, you know, someone in the, in his ear be, after the first time he made it, he let them listen to it. And they were like, this sucks. He's like, Ed's, right. Ed's saying, yeah, you're right. And he just gets rid of it. Think about how much value of his life, but think about the value he's added and impacted in everyone's life. If that many people listen to that song, they must have been attracted to something, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's such a such a good point to make when it comes to that. Just being gracious with yourself, having that patience, but also cutting out the negativity. Sometimes you need to be told you suck because you're sitting on a high horse and you should get somebody who loves you to do that, but they shouldn't be trying to tear you down. They should communicate in a way that will build you up. So um yeah. It depends on your. It depends on your personality. Yeah, my my wife will be like, "Yeah, that sucked." And uh, I know she's coming from a uh, uh, a point of love, you know, because she she's like, "Yeah, I want I want to see you succeed." And uh, and you know, I have pretty thick skin, so for, for me, it's okay. Yeah, uh, uh, there were only like three tears shed at that time. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but but you know if someone else said said that uh, it would it would like hurt you know so i i think it depends on your personality um and it's also for that person to be to modulate what they're saying right according to what you can handle at the time absolutely well awesome pranay what are the highest impact daily actions that are going to tick the needle forward towards your dreams and goals so I work on deadlines, uh, everything to the last minute. Uh, there's uh, this system, it's probably 20 years old now, called Getting Things Done. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been trying to implement that, uh, trying and failing. But one of the biggest things that I got from that book is if anything takes less than two, if you have something to do, it takes less than two minutes, just do it. You know, And that's been a game changer for me. You know, uh, I think about an email, it takes two minutes, just go ahead and do it, you know? Um, so I, I think little tips and tricks along the way. Um, and I've, oh, I've tried, you know, there's a miracle all morning and all this stuff. And this, you know, nothing has been able to stick, but I've been taking a little piece from this, from that to try to create my perfect ritual. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a work in progress. I've realized that now that I've been, you know, somewhat successful plus or minus, um, and I've been able to 
talk to people a lot more successful than me. I feel like it's Wizard of Oz. I've gotten to look behind a curtain. Like we're all a mess. Like we yeah. don't, you know, we don't know what we're doing. We don't have this perfect schedule where we're super efficient. There's a lot of downtime. Things don't work. Uh, it's kind of like at a wedding, you know. Uh, at your wedding, you're like everything went wrong. <laughs> and when you're talking to the 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 guests, they're like, "Oh, this is great! Like yeah. Yeah. they're having so much fun." But because you know all the stuff that's going wrong, uh, you're a lot more critical on yourself. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> I like the, if it takes um, less than two minutes to do it, just do it. I think I've heard about that system one other time, but now I have to go check it out because I've heard it twice now. So um, I love it. You know what What you can do, uh, Timmy, you could um, uh, go to uh, go to YouTube, do uh, getting getting things done. And you'll watch like a 20 minute video of uh, uh, from someone that is like doing a review uh, and uh, will teach you pretty much everything you need to know. So you don't have to read this like 300 page book. Love it. Love it. And what character trait do you most need to develop right now to make your dream life come true? For me specifically? Yep. For you specifically. For me specifically. Uh, let me think about that. Um, I think... Uh, being a little bit less modest uh, and yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you're a beast. You know, uh, that's, that's something, you know, modesty is something that, uh, you know, a lot of people value, you know, pretty uh, self-deprecating. Uh, but I think at some point you have to start talking about your wins, you know? Um, and uh, I, I think that's a balance, you know? Um, I, I think a lot of people like, uh, my humor, uh, but it, it's yeah. also, you have to be like, yeah, you know, I bought a quarter billion dollars worth of real estate in two years. You know, that's pretty significant. Uh, more than and... pretty significant. <laughs> You're being modest again. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I, I think, I think a lot of us, uh, naturally have difficulty in that. Um, and you know, a lot, I know a lot of people are super successful, you know, multi, multi millionaires and they'll be like, yeah, you know, it's always someone better, but th th that's always going to be true. But I think you do people that follow you a disservice if you always uh, limit yourself, right? Or put yourself down because then what if someone is following you and looking up to you, then what do you, what would they think, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I like that perspective on it, especially because we talked about kids, talked about employees, but when you build the thought leadership platform and people are looking up to you, like I really look up to guys like Grant Cardone and Alex Hormozzi who are doing big things in a big way. When they say something, it affects my perspective on the world. Like Alex Hormozzi isn't a Christian. I am a Christian. And he has made me look at Christianity in a different way, not necessarily become less faithful or more faithful, but just interpret scripture in a way that I wouldn't have done before. And it has affected my belief system at a foundational level in a way that I really like. But if he had been saying incorrect information, or like, yeah, you suck and you're going to suck for the rest of your life. And I had respected him enough to kind of internalize that. It could really hurt you. So, um, yeah, I think it's there's kind of a moral obligation there almost to be less modest and just be real, be honest, you know, about where you're at. So I like that. Cool. Well, if there were one or two people that you could meet right now, and this could be a specific person or a type of person, and they'd really help you take that next step towards your dreams and goals, who would that person be and how would they help you? Uh, you know, we've talked about Alex a lot, but I, I've actually been thinking about uh, hitting him up. He, uh, what does he say? Uh, you know, if you make $3 million in revenue, which I think we're almost there, yeah. uh, to, to reach out to him. Um, he's been able to uh, create, you know, this like beast. Uh, and um, so that's been helpful. Um, I am trying to find um, someone in real estate that's built something that uh, we want to create, but I haven't found at that person. So it's going to be kind of a question mark for that one. Um, I found, I found someone that has created, you know, pieces. So like they'll have done like a 30 year multifamily, been super successful, but we want to create kind of like a, you know, like the GE for finance, uh, in, uh, for doctors. So, uh, haven't found that person yet, but you know, maybe there won't be a single person, but there'll be kind of, a, a you know, mirrored people that all combine to make that one moment. Pernay, did we meet each other through Podmatch or Hunter Thompson or Adam Carswell? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> do you know Hunter Thompson uh, and Adam? I, I do. Yeah. I, so I know I know Hunter. 
I know Hunter. Uh, I am on Podmatch, and uh, did you say Croswell? Yeah, Adam Carswell. Uh, that I don't know. So gotcha. probably one of the first. We time. met on Podmatch for sure. Then. Yeah, <laughs> Hunter and I aren't closely connected, but his right hand man is Adam, and um, Adam and I are connected. But I was oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of people have uh, told me to reach out to him. Um, I do know Hunter. Um, we have uh, run into uh, similar circles. We use the same lawyer. Yeah, uh, I got so, that. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Well, we are going to skip the thriving three here and we're going to jump yeah. right into the last couple of questions because we got about yeah. four to five minutes here. So, yeah, these can get a bit personal. If you want to pass, you can pass. If not, just answer them and then we'll move on. So, mm -hmm. the first question is What is one limiting belief that continues to pop up in your life, if any? Uh, you know, I think uh, there are. We always hit limiting beliefs. So I was talking to Brandon Turner uh, the other day uh, at our conference, uh, and he's like someone. Bigger pockets, uh, Brandon Turner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. dude, you are so cool. <laughs> 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 that is epic. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was talking to him, who is the nicest guy in the world. He will, he will give everyone the time of day, you know. And he was saying, like, you know, a lot of the issues I have, and I talk to these billionaires are this and the advice they give me is the same advice i give to people that are younger than me and want to be me you know so we we almost hit the same limiting belief but it's at a different scale you know mm. so for example i can't raise five million dollars you know and you hit that and you're like i can't raise 10 million dollars you mm. hit that you know i can't raise 15 million dollars or you know for us we had like two deals back to back uh we're like oh can't do it and you know we had to do it right yep. so I think it's it's all the same. It's like you can't do this, you can't do something. And I feel that um a lot of times in Tony Robbins talks about this. We switch we go to the how. We go directly to the how. Like, how am I supposed to do that? You know? And your brain works overdrive, right? Uh, to think of reasons why, right? Because you're putting your brain engine into thinking all the ways that this cannot happen, right? But if you switch that around and you're like, okay, why do I need this to happen, right? Why? Yep. Why? So now you're like, okay, all the reasons that this has to happen, and then you'll figure out a how later, right? So the how should be like the last thing yep. that you think about. But we always go to this the first thing. You know, we actually had an employee um, that as soon as I'd have an idea, she'd be like, okay, how are we supposed to do that? Or we have too much stuff going on. And then after a while, like I stopped coming to her for ideas. And uh, in one of the businesses, it kind of stagnated a little bit. Um, and we ended up having to get rid of her because she was just such a roadblock, you know, and it was a bunch of bureaucracy and, you know, all the companies that I'm in or founded, they're all startups. Like they, it's all about innovation, right? Because if you get too bureaucratic, too slow, like why wouldn't they, people just go with the company that is, already you know the big one you know a public company that's... yeah with billions yeah. of dollars behind it yeah 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 you people come to you because they like something new they like you as a person they like that you're innovative but if you need an sop if you need like uh if you need a full system built out for everything then uh you're going to really limit yourself so um i think focusing on the how but then i tell you that but I, I literally said, how are we going to do that yesterday? You know, <laughs> it's yeah. like, uh, it's, it's, it's trying to remind yourself, you know, and you got to have some, and I, I think that's why it's really good, uh, good, really good to uh, have uh, partners, you know, so I have for Ascent, there's three of us, all the doctors, and we just call ourselves out. We're like, yeah, did you just say that? Like, how are we going to do that? You know? Um, and uh, I think that's great. It's super hard to find a great founder uh, or co-founder, but other than your your spouse, uh, your co-founder is like the most important relationship you can have. Mm. I love that. Well, Pranay, we're out of time. Do you got two more minutes for this last question? Yeah, I got plenty of time. Okay. I love it. I love it. So... I'm talking about Alex Hormozzi again. I mentioned him like three to four times every time on the podcast. <laughs> every time I do an episode because uh, he's in my head. <laughs> um, <laughs> but 
He said that the difference between manipulation and help is intent. And I think his point here is that you're influencing people in both situations, but manipulation is about getting somebody to do something you want them to do while helping somebody is seeking to understand and then helping them get to the place that they want to go based on your understanding of it. This question is about help, not manipulation. So there's a common saying that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. I actually found out from Dr. Alan Leica, who was a guest on the show, that you can make a horse drink. You just have to salt its oats. Now, I want you to think of a person with a really fixed mindset, not willing to accept help, not willing to accept change, but they hate their life. How can we, you and I, create an environment to salt their oats and help them change their life? So there's two two ways to do this, and I would recommend trying to talk about what So you start off with pain points. So you're like, a lot of times when we have issues, it's hard for us to think about the future, right? Because we're we're an optimistic uh, species, right? We think the future is going to get better. So you say, hey, uh, do that with a fixed mindset. How will your life be as nothing changes? Let's do three years, five years, 10 years, right? Everything's the same. So for example, in medicine, we talked about being burned out, right? You continue to be burned out. What's going to happen in five years? You know, maybe you can't work anymore. How are you going to make money, right? How are you going to support your family? And uh, you, you just tell them, you don't need open-ended, right? How would your life be if nothing changed in five years? And silence, right? Don't say anything. And it's you have to get at least give it 10 seconds. Literally count one, one thousand, two, one thousand. It's gonna be awkward. It's like, you know, if I just said nothing, you know, people are gonna see that. They'll be like, oh, what? Huh? Like, yeah. you know, they get they came back for a second, right? With that silence. Um, so just sit there, don't talk, and let them think about all the things that can go wrong because we don't normally think about that, right? We don't think about all the bad things will happen if nothing changes, right? Because we we expect change in the future, right? Now, um, not everyone, that doesn't uh, affect everyone, right? So on the flipping, right, talk about, okay, so if you make X, Y, and cheat, uh, Z change, how will your life be different, right? So then you're getting that small select group of people that um, that doesn't get affected. So you're, you're getting them to think about the negative if nothing changes and the positive, right? So it's kind of a sales technique, uh, but it's letting them think about it, right? You're not really adding anything, right? You're not, you're, you're just having them think about the future, right? And then they'll tell you, they'll tell you, okay, you know, if I don't change, I'm going to be burnt out and I'm going to, uh, leave medicine, right? And do you want that to happen? No. Okay. So how do we uh, give you flexibility so that you can do the medicine you love and you can work for 20, 30 years, right? So uh, okay. for my example, get you a good investment so that maybe you don't have to work weekends. Maybe you don't have to work nights, you know? Um, I'm not going to replace your whole salary right away, but over time you can, you can get that flexibility to do what you want. You know, maybe you take another vacation, uh, maybe you spoil your wife, right? Um, or your husband. Uh, and so uh, then you're getting them to think, right? And then uh, Alex always talks about to find that one that one objection, right? Um, if it wasn't this, I would do it, right? Find out what that one thing is and see if you can solve it. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. And I am so glad you brought in the sales process because I think this question is a lot about because you can't make the decision to change for somebody. I think everybody kind of knows that or argues with that fact. You're either arguing with it or you've accepted it. <laughs> One of the two is happening. But what you can do is um, kind of help them get past their own objections and sell them on themselves, which is why I think the best we can do is to learn how to sell and then try to sell people on themselves. Like, what are your objections to becoming your best self? And let's help you get past them. So I like that you brought sales into that. Um, but yeah, Pranay, that is all we got for you. Is there anything else you want to chat about before we sign off? No, um, I have a podcast, uh, you know, talk about uh, my journey, talk to different entrepreneurs, tips and tricks. So it's called From MD to Entrepreneur Podcast. There we go. If you guys were listening to this and you loved what Pranay had to say, you loved his vibe, go check out his podcast. If you happen to be a doctor and you want to invest, 
go invest with his company. I'm sure he would uh, love to chat with you. What's the best way to reach you? Is it the podcast, LinkedIn, email? Yeah. So uh, our website for the real estate company is ascentequitygroup.com. Um, there's, you can sign up for our newsletter, find out about deals, find out about our thoughts of the current real estate market. Uh, there's a way to contact me on there. And then, uh, my podcast is on Apple, Amazon, Spotify, all those. There we go. Awesome. Well, Pranay, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much. Of course. And thank you guys for listening. We will see you on the next one. All the ways to contact him will be down in the show notes. And on that note, we're out. <laughs>